Hello, it's John Heaton here, and again with special guest Dave Costello. Hi. Another video from Bristol, England. And today we're going to review the original EP of Magical Mystery Tour, which later that year became an album in the US, and it wasn't until 1976 that that album was released in the UK. But anyway, we're going to review the EP, talk a bit about the tracks which were featured on the US LP a bit later, including this single, All You Need Is Love. But uh, to the EP, Dave, interesting times for the Beatles. December, Brian Epstein obviously dead. Um, they had to bounce back and do something. Yeah, I mean, it's often cited as being Paul, Paul's beginning of taking control over the Beatles. And, um, but they all, the others went along with it and like it or loathe it, it was a product. It was a, I often think of Magical Mystery Tour as being the moon to Sgt Pepper's sun. They were like two sides of the same amazing year and it 67 was in many ways the peak of the Beatles star before the White Elm <laughs> <laughs> that's another yes. video altogether okay um, but it was the fl amazing flowering of, um, <coughs> of lots yeah. of things interesting I mean commercially speaking it did very well it got to number one the music no problems with the music with the film uh, people had problems but we're not here to review the film Although, suffice to say, it's a lot better than the critics made it out to be. And just a tip, you've got to see it in colour. Black and white doesn't make much sense. So, uh, Dave, I'll let you start off with the title track. OK, well, Magical Mystery Tour, basically a, a, a really good rock song. And uh, seagulls, instead of Ferengi <laughs> Airport, we're dealing with British seagulls. Um, yeah. A, Good rock song, nothing, nothing special, but it was certainly a good aperitif for the album. A bit like Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, where that fits as the, the opening song, almost kind of whetting your appetite for what's to come. So I think pretty good. And Paul still plays it live, so he likes it. Yeah, I mean, I have to say it's not one of my favourites. I think it's OK. It does its job as leading off the album adequately, but it's not, class it's not a classic for me. Whereas the next song, Fool on the Pill, I mean, <laughs> Fool on the Hill, uh, I think everyone agrees, is just an all-time Paul classic, one of his best ever ballads. Yeah, one of my favourite Paul songs ever. I would consider having this played at my funeral, actually. Um, not that it's an unhappy song, uh, okay. but it's just a, it's a wonderful song, yeah, wonderful song. And you hear the, the demo versions, it's interesting hearing how the song evolved. Of course, the finished version is the superior version. Uh, but yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful Beatles dreamy kind of have a herbal jazz cigarette and drift away somewhere sort of a song. Yeah, and, it, and to illustrate further how mad things were in, the, in 1967, to record the, the sequence for Fool on the Hill for the film, Paul just took off to France and uh, filmed that sequence of him jumping up and down on the, on the grass. In the Pyrenees. Uh, the summer in France, I think. Yeah, isn't it? The, yeah. The above Nice. He went with Mal. But uh, anyway, it made for a good mm. sequence to the film, uh, and so we're we're very happy with that track. Uh, the next track on the album, I think the the album the order on the EP is different, but we'll mm. we'll just go through side one of the album, which was basically the songs on this EP, and the next song is Flying, which I think we we like is a very good instrumental. Yeah, it's the only song in the whole Beatles canon. Credited with writing credits, credited to all four Beatles, Starkey and Harrison included. Yep. Um, it's an instrumental, but has the, well, what do we call it? The vibe. I mean, what do you mean, the, the psychedelic vibe, the, the, yeah. the, the good melody, and good it, use yeah. of, I don't know what keyboard they're playing, but it sounds Melo pretty... Probably a Mellotron, yeah, maybe. Sounds Great Ringo good. drumming as well, just that sloppy yeah. kind of psychedelic chug that Ringo was, yeah. had perfected by this time. Yeah, and the sequence to this in the film with the, the footage outside the coach yeah. window as they go through Iceland or somewhere, yeah. it's pretty good. Yeah. By the way, I just have to point out the, the packaging of this little booklet, very similar to the American album. Uh, same cartoons throughout, but when this was released, uh, the film hadn't actually come out on TV. It wasn't broadcast till Boxing Day, so all these Pictures would have been new to the to the fans. Yeah, it would have been so intriguing to have seen this and to have not seen the film. Very exciting. Yeah. So, which brings us to George's track, Blue Jay Way. 
which uh, I have to say is not one of my favourites. Um, I get it that it's psychedelic and it's quite atmospheric, and the f in the film I think it works with the George in the orange, uh, the multi-layered orange uh, suit sitting on his cross-legged on the, the car floor. Park. Yeah, this sequence. Yeah, it's a great video. It's a great. I don't video, know. Do you, do you like that song? Uh, I don't dislike it, but it w I wouldn't jump out as being one of my favourite George songs. I think yeah. you know the, the the George songs that followed in '68 were better. So um, you know the Inner Light um, and Within You, Without You from Pepper was better. I think. Yeah, yeah. This isn't. And it's, it's, it's still a bit of an Indian sort of uh, melody to it. But it, yeah, it's, it's. I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't like to say it's bad. I wouldn't like to say it's great. I, I like it. And, but you get the words here, and I can't help but be amused, but in Blue Jay Way, the last ten lines of the song is, please don't be long, please don't be long, and the song does go on too long. And so George, George was waiting in Bel Air um, at somebody's house, he was waiting for Derek Taylor to turn up, I think, and some friends, and they were, they yeah. were he was waiting for hours because of a fog or smog that had descended in... LA? Maybe I've just yep, made there's that a fog upon movie. LA. Yeah, my friends yeah. have lost their way. Exactly. Absolutely, well remembered. Yes. Okay, uh, which brings us to, I think, my highlight of this entire EP, which is I Am The Walrus. I think it's one of John's wackiest lyric, uh, just brilliant lines, semolina custard dripping from a dead dog's eye. I just love it. the whole tongue-in-cheek lyric and uh, impulsive beat and tune, two notes on the piano the police siren I just think it's genius I mean I'd love to have known what this song sounded like in 1967 because we were used to that's the thing we're used to these songs now we've, they've been around in the you know in the cultural atmosphere for years and it's very hard to think that would have been like a Martian spaceship landing to have heard I am the walrus do you think yeah no you're not said little Nicola <laughs> okay so uh, that closes the the film songs, and then quickly we're going to talk about what filled side B of the, the LP and it's started. Oh, crumbs! How could I forget that? Your mother should know from Paul. And uh, rather annoyingly, in his book Revolution in the Head, Ian MacDonald complains that the Beatles slowed down in the second verse, which was a sign of getting tired or some garbage like that. I think it's a great track, and. Uh, Okay, comes in for stick along with all his other vaudeville mm. numbers like Honey Pie. But oh, the Beatles would have been so much poorer without that, that yeah, that vaudeville nineteen thirties vibe that Paul brought. Yeah, Honey Pie, Your Mother Should Know, um, when I'm sixty four, and then later in with Wings as well. With you gave me the answer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, great, great songs, great songs. Like you know, did he dream these? Was he being yeah. I think a song like that is almost beyond criticism. I mean, uh, I loved it. I loved when I first heard "Your Mother Should Know." Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I I, I heard it on um, a London radio station where they used to have Beatles days every August bank holiday. Yeah. They would have a Beatles day, and I used to sit there with my cassette recorder recording them, and I didn't know what they were called. Some of the yeah. songs, but um, I remember hearing that and thinking, "This is amazing." Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. if you played it to your mother, she might not be that pleased because it said though she was born a long, long time ago. Your mother should know, but uh, anyway. Yeah. And it's a great sequence in the film as well. Brilliant. It's, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the finale. It's that sequence in the film. Yeah. yeah. And that sequence. And, that, and on the back cover, yeah. So, I think we're, we're pretty happy with the songs. We won't talk about the film here, but it's a lot better than it's made out to be. And... Uh, now we're going to quickly cover what's on the second side, and it starts off with a 1967 single from around about the same time as the, this film came out, Hello Goodbye, um, and rather scandalously, I'm the Walrus appears on its B-side, and it's obviously the mm. superior track. I know John was upset about that. I don't know too much about that, uh, that decision. I thought it was a double A-side. No, it was a B-side. Wow. I mean, obviously, Hello Goodbye was a massive hit, and it's very commercial, but as a song, I find it quite annoying. What do you think? Well, I mean, um, maybe not annoying, but I, I don't think it's in. I, don't I, think I it's like it. Favorites. I like it in terms of the production. To be honest, I love Ringo's drumming again. Yeah. I love it. I love the banging piano chords. I like the the coda at the end, which was becoming quite a popular Beatles trademark. Yeah, that, that bit, Strawberry I think that Fields. Was, uh, John's favourite <clears throat> bit. 
Yeah. It uh, is deceptively simple. I think it works. It's just maybe I've heard it too much or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then tracks two and three on side two are the single from Pre Pepper, the beginning of the year, uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. I don't think any comment was really necessary. They're both classics, and I think they fit on well on the album. Yeah, yeah. All the, all the songs from the Mystery Tour US album are, are from the same year. Well, it makes a really same strong year. album, it, it, an incredibly coherent, strong album of those 67 tracks. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, they should be... It's great that they're on an album. Uh, you yeah. know, if you can't get hold of the EP, then, of course, you know, you've got a, great, yeah. you've got a, a gem of a, of a Beatles album. I think one of the good things some of the US LPs did do is, is mop up some of the singles, as Dave said, to put Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane on an album rather than being lost on a single. And they did, did the same with the Hey Jude album, putting Lady Madonna and mm. um, pa Paperback Writer and Hey Jude and Revolution and Ballad of Johnny Although Nelson that was a bit more of a stretch, wasn't it? Because they were such different eras. Yeah, but I, I'm really pleased to have those on an album yeah, which yeah. came out at the time rather than on the red or the blue. Yeah. So what else is left? Okay, we're left with uh, the tracks from this single, All You Need Is Love, with its B-side, Baby, You're a Rich Man. And uh, this was the, the song which was broadcast all around the world, All You Need Is Love. And uh, it's just timeless. Yeah, that was the ultimate flowering of the Beatles pushing the Aquarian age. <laughs> um, yeah, it was kind of, you could argue it was the beginning of going down the other side of the curve for them after... After all, all you need is love, really. I think. Yeah, I love the bit in the anthology when they, it starts off with it black and white, and then it transforms yeah, to colour. Yeah, I watched that uh, recently on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it's a great video. Yeah, uh, very happy to have all this video footage of a lot of. Uh, and then, uh, songs. and then the B side is like it's it's a very it's like, would you say it's overlooked and not very well known? Oh, yeah, it's I a Lennon, say, yeah, it's a Lennon it. classic. It was a th he would he would say it was a throwaway song, but. Um, it's uh, the lyrics are actually, I think, quite deep. Um, uh, but what is to die for in that song is the bass line. I mean, it's probably could arguably be one of Paul's best bass lines in a Beatles song. I think, yeah. I mean, throughout the year '67, his bass lines were mm. so innovative mm. and melodic, leaping up and down. Yeah, like it was like lead guitar in a way. He, yeah. I think he, I read that he would often put the bass line on at the end, yeah. uh, when the rest of the song had been formed. Yeah. And but yeah, it's just the texture and the pushing. Um, and you play, you know, play baby or a rich man loud with the bass and uh, the bass up. Yeah. And it's yeah, quite phenomenal. So, Brilliant. Okay, well that was our thoughts on Magical Mystery Tour. Perhaps got a, a less than that deserves reputation because of the film which came with it um, but we're, we're here to talk about the music and I think it's it's up there along with the Beatles best work and when it's good it's just brilliant and there's only maybe one or two tracks which are not complete top draw. So what did you give Pepper? Well, what Mark obviously Pepper I'd give Pepper a 10 and um, I'd give this one a 10 as well. Please to hear. You, know. you don't give Me Beatles too. albums less than 10. Me too. Really? Do you? No. Okay, thank you for watching guys. See you later. Thank you. Cheers.